Hello, everybody, again, and welcome back to Moonshine's Classroom. Um, this is our last podcast, and arguably, maybe a favorite of Ma'am Pia and mine is the topic and yeah of personality. So we're both really excited to dig into this topic, and I guess we can just jump straight into it. So, Ma'am, um, why should we study personality? Okay, I think the moment anybody gets into a psychology class, uh, when they think of psychology, actually what they think of is personality psychology. Because mm-hmm. uh, usually, like at the beginning of the semester, you know, I ask people, oh, why do you want to, what comes to mind when you say the, the word psychology or why are, do you want to study psychology? And most of the answers revolve around, oh, I want to understand people. I want to understand their behavior. I want to understand why they do this or that. And um, uh, we went through many uh, perspectives already uh, that answers those questions, the physiological perspective, why people do what they do is because this is how their bodies work the um, cognitive perspective, because this is how we remember things. This is how we learn. And then the behaviorist, this is how we learn things. Um, This is how we develop. Um, But usually what people go towards is personality, Mm -hmm. um, because this is the obvious um, thing about people that we regularly interact with. Why does this person like uh, to talk? Why does this person like to be the center of attention? Why does this person uh, always hide? This person always hides. The moment they get attention, they're like, they climb up. Okay. Usually, uh, we think of that when we try to answer those questions. So why do people do that? we actually go the route of these personality theories we'll be talking about. Oh, maybe they did that because uh, this was their experience as a child, okay? Or maybe they do that because, um, well, that's what we're gonna talk about today, okay? So it will allow us even more perspectives to answer those kinds of questions. All right, so uh, next is exploring one of the first perspectives and personality psychology, which would be a, another popular um, figure that we've talked about before, which is Sigmund Freud. So let's talk about why is the unconscious mind a large focus in psychoanalysis? All right, because, um, well, okay, the unconscious mind, which actually it can be argued that Freud was not the first person to talk about this thing called, Mm -hmm. um, but he was the one who became the most popular for it. Um, So he talked about the unconscious, which is the part of us that we cannot access, but somehow it's filled with things that shape our behavior. So um, start with, for example, memory, okay? And childhood. Uh, Sigmund Freud was the one who really talked about how much of our memories we don't about our childhood and how we grew up we don't remember, but these things still affect us as adults. So when he postulated that, the next question is, well, so what does that mean about our mind? Well, it means that not everything is in our awareness. That most things, actually, most experiences are found in what is not in our awareness, therefore our unconscious mind. So it's really a large focus in psychoanalysis because the idea is that much of what we do, um, we don't really understand because it comes from that place. It comes from these things we don't remember uh, and and. Um, our behaviors are nudged by these things, by these drives, by these impulses, by these um, that are formed from those memories and those experiences from childhood. Um, and also some things that we're just born with, okay? because they're instinctual, they're just there because we're human. So um, this might sound familiar, or I don't know, is it just because I'm a psychologist and this is like everyday life to me, <laughs> uh, right? I think in pop culture, you know, in, in you know, 
the outside world this is not such a unusual concept mm -hmm. yeah and, that we um, there are a lot of things that drive our behavior that we don't we can't explain or yeah or, or that we don't driven understand. to certain things or situations or people and we can't put a finger on it so yeah right okay. so yeah there that is what freud uh wanted to expound upon okay so to uh, understand the, the unconscious even more what he did was i mean of course okay this is the part where i cue the students so if you want to read more go read about the drives and the instincts because uh it's there mm -hmm. it's one of the first things freud um uh, theorized about okay but when, and then he also theorized about what's called the, the, the levels of the psyche. So the unconscious, the pre-conscious, the conscious. Mm -hmm. um, you can look into that right now. It's like yeah. the iceberg kind yeah. of diagram. So. Yeah, right. But what, one of the more popular theories that Freud um, became known for and really kind of changed the landscape of, uh, and still does, kind of affect the landscape of psychology until now is his theory of the id ego and superego. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, our unconscious is mostly populated by this thing called the id. Okay. Mm -hmm. And to me, every time I, I mention what the id is and I try to explain what the id is, I always talk about how, you know, the id is, uh, well, the id operates on um, the pleasure principle. Mm -hmm. The id is like this little brat, this little baby that knows nothing else but what it wants. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't care about whether it's realistic or not, whether it can get what it wants or not, whether it makes sense or not. It doesn't care. It's just that little brat saying, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me now, 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 now. Mm -hmm. Right. And it acts like that because the id is absolutely disconnected from uh, conscious reality. Mm -hmm. It has no idea what's going on out there. Mm -hmm. okay? It is not connected to it at all. So that's why sometimes at um, you know 3 a.m., mm -hmm. uh, maybe you're binge watching something. So that's already something that's very id driven, you know, when you just can't stop watching your K drama oh, and yeah. it's 3 a.m. and yeah. you're nodding off, but you're like, no, I want them. I want some more. Okay. <laughs> that's already very id, right? It's just, you know, you just want. But then while you're watching, you get a sudden craving for something absolutely random. Give me something random, like or some random food that you can't get at 3 a.m. Jelly beans. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. You get a sudden craving for jelly beans. And there are these particular jelly beans. Maybe there are these specific jelly beans. You know, those um, ice cream jelly beans. Oh, yeah. Like the ones that taste like dessert. Yeah. Like yeah. it really Not tastes like... the ones that like... taste like earwax or anything. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Maybe yeah. it's a specific one. It's, mm. it's like the strawberry shortcake yeah. jelly bean. Ooh, that one's a good one. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Or the birthday cake jelly bean. Mm, yeah or the apple pie jelly bean, right? These specific things, all of a sudden you get a craving for it. And I'm just, and you're like, where am I even gonna get that? How am I even gonna get that? Of course, nowadays we have ways to satisfy these cravings. You get on Lazada, you start changing more. Oops, uh, uh, not unintended, not a promotion, okay? But, but yeah, right? But then you're, that's the part of you your id that just wants what it wants, doesn't matter if it's doable or not. It just wants what it wants. That's your id, okay? It doesn't know that it's 3 a.m. and there's no way for you get to get it now, right? Yeah. So anyway, so that's your id, right? Your id is there in your unconscious and it has no way of reaching consciousness. Um, that's why when we feel it, it doesn't make sense most of the time. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the id is also where we push down things we don't like <laughs> or things we cannot ex accept about ourselves, our reality. Mm -hmm. So when you say someone's in denial, um, in, in, a, in Freudian psychoanalysis, what that means is they push something down into their unconscious mm -hmm. and cannot access it, but it's expressing itself somehow through this thing called denial. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's 
one uh what does he call it province of the mind mm -hmm. okay the id there's and that's what we're born with yes we're born so with, we see that in babies and how they they don't care about their yeah. about adults not being able to satisfy their needs but like if they don't if they don't have something right now they're gonna cry and cry. yeah that's yeah the and all probably, of them. yeah they're probably not gonna stop until they get it mm -hmm. or until they tire themselves up mm -hmm. okay so yeah id little baby and sometimes we get mad at that baby but we also it's good to understand that baby has no idea what's happening out here mm -hmm. <laughs> right so it's also to remember that okay good to remember that um but then aside from that okay so the baby grows up a little more and develops this thing called the super ego mm -hmm. okay of course this is the part where i cue the development of the super ego according to freud this is really controversial uh <laughs> kind of gross thing but if you want to get into that that's the ego <laughs> that's the phallic stage in the oedipus complex okay mm -hmm. um but the short version is um children eventually learn that there are things that they cannot get mm -hmm. right they cannot live in the world only running on the pleasure principle so they begin to be told no you cannot do that you cannot do this mm -hmm. and this no and the structure of the world around them um that is taught to them probably by their parents okay? mm -hmm or just their experiences of being uh, told, don't do that, do this. You have to be like this, or you cannot be like that. Um, this is what creates this other part of us um, that's partly unconscious, actually still mostly unconscious, only a little part of it is conscious, called the superego. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the superego is that. It's the part of us that knows the rules of the world. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, it is labeled as like the moral part. Okay. So it operates on the moral principle. Um, but I like to say it's the, it's the one that knows the rules and the laws mm -hmm. as taught to it by um, the adults around. Okay. So also the immature childhood. Yeah, the immature superego is just, okay, these are the rules. Mm -hmm. This is what I can do. This is what I cannot do. So there's no, um, a lot of it is unconscious because there's no real awareness of what is right or wrong for the most part. It's just good or bad. Uh, um, I am punished or I am not. Okay. So here you can kind of see the cross between this part and our uh, discussion last time on uh, pre-conventional morality. Okay, so the immature superego is pre-conventionally moral. Yeah. Right? Right. So it's just the imbibed rules from the parents and the outside world. Mm -hmm. Take it in and now it, you know, it becomes part of us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's that voice in your head. It's, it's your conscience. Well, part of it is your conscience, that, like the Jiminy Cricket mm -hmm. type that tells you if this is a good or bad thing. And the other part of this uh, superego is called your ego ideal. Ah, this is who I should be. I should be a lawyer. I should be a, uh, a doctor. I should be a model student, a good daughter. All of these things, the shoulds of a person, are reside in the superego. And again, much of these things are in the unconscious. We don't know we act in this way on purpose because but because it is just there in our unconscious that no you got to be a good daughter you got to be a good student you got to have a's you got to have you got to be pretty you got to be sporty uh, you got to be athletic etc so it's a lot of you got to be mm -hmm. okay. that lot of that's shit. not from the inside it's actually from the outside and this is the point where it's like okay so you have a thing it's floating around in the in the unconscious called the id which just wants what it wants now no rules and then you have a thing called the super ego that says no you can't have that mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you think's happening what, yeah. what's gonna so happen a lot there? of conflict yeah. yeah and they're both detached from reality right so it's like they're they're both really um resolute in what they want and right. it's gonna crash right. so they're gonna fight mm -hmm. okay 
Um, but good thing is, that's not all there is to us. It's not just a clash between our baby self and our parent self. Okay? Um, there is the part of us called the ego, which um, is really there uh, the moment we realize that, oh, there's a world out there that is not in me. Okay? But the ego really develops over time uh, as we um, grow into mature adulthood. Okay. So the ego's main role, actually, uh, according to Freud, the healthy ego is the one that can regulate the ids, the, um, demands, and also regulate the superego's demands. So the e ego is like a mediator between these two things that can be both very unrealistic. Your super ego demands can be like, you have to have all A's, mm -hmm. which is extremely unrealistic. Okay, all the freshmen in the room, mm -hmm. this is extremely yeah. unrealistic. Do not put that pressure on yourself, <laughs> okay? So, um, so the ego, so I am here talking like the ego saying, what an unrealistic thing to ask because, hmm, of course, people are going to be good at some things, good at some subjects, and not good at other subjects. Yeah. There are going to be subjects you're more interested in and subjects you're less interested in. So likely there will be a variation in your performance as well. And this is not a bad thing. This is simply a human thing. So that's my ego talking. Mm -hmm. I am looking out into the world and looking at how realistically, how might a person actually act? Right. What is a realistic output from people? And so the ego now has a role of saying, you know, super ego, that's very demanding. But maybe we can ask them to perform well in the ones that they like, mm -hmm. in the subjects that they like. And it is like, I don't want to do anything I don't want. <laughs> I just want to pay attention to the things I want to pay attention to. Okay. I just want to Netflix and... Yeah. Stream all day. <laughs> yeah. And then the ego is like, no, you like this. Mm -hmm. You like psychology. You like talking about yourself. <laughs> right? That's fun to talk about yourself. Okay. So, like, so, and it might actually be fun for the id to be like, yeah, me, 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 me. Right. Yeah. So, so I'm trying to describe how a mediation between id and superego via the ego can be. Because truth is, yes, um, no matter what the id says and no matter what the superego says, there are external needs, goals, grades that need to be met. Okay, um, But the ego hopefully finds a realistic way of, of uh, achieving it. Okay? in a way that hopefully is healthy for itself. Mm -hmm. So the ego operates on what is called the realistic principle. So mm -hmm. it looks at like, for example, the semester, okay? We're now moving everything online. Um, maybe the ego will say, okay, well, how do you help yourself regulate your uh, study habits? The super ego will be like, oh my God, you, you make a schedule, you have to study three hours a day, every day. And then the ego is like, not realistic. Mm -hmm. Maybe not every day. Mm -hmm. You keep the weekends. Right? Yeah. And then the ego is like, I don't want to study any day. And then this ego is like, yeah, you do. It's interesting. This mm -hmm. is interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, so, so there. And that's how we function, mm -hmm. uh, according to <laughs> Sigmund Freud. It's that interaction between those, those three. And healthy people will have a strong ego function mm -hmm. because they can regulate the pleasure principle, meaning if the ego, if the it suddenly has a craving for jelly beans in the middle of the night, the ego will say, uh, and then the super ego says, you don't deserve it. You didn't do your requirements yet. And then the ego will say, okay, what's the middle ground? Maybe you order it now so that by the time it arrives, you would have finished your requirements and it mm -hmm. will be your reward. Mm -hmm. So this is negotiation and, mm -hmm. and this is healthy functioning according to Freud. All right. What about defense mechanisms? Freud also talks about that. What are common examples of those and how do they play out in real life? Okay. So um, 
to talk about defense mechanisms, I'll start from, so now we know the function of the ego, mm -hmm. which is to regulate the person. Okay. But the id is very strong, the unconscious. Mm -hmm. There are lots of things there that we have pushed down because we can't accept it. Mm -hmm. Like, um, for example, you're attracted to this person. You don't want to be so you push it down and you say no 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 i'm not and, and you know um our psyche is sometimes that good that we push it down so hard that we really are not conscious of the fact that this person is attractive to me okay that i have a crush on this person okay that pushing down and the holding down of something in the unconscious is um, done via these um, things that Freud calls defense mechanisms. Mm -hmm. okay? It's a way for um, it's a way for the ego to regulate the pressure mm -hmm. okay, uh, of pushing down things by releasing them somehow in ways that are distorted. What does that mean, right? So case in point, maybe in high school, some of you remember the this person, everybody knows that this person has a crush on this other person. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows ex person A has a crush on person B. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows that except person A. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is called the defense mechanism of? Repression. Okay. Repression is the basic yeah. uh, mechanism. Yeah. Repression is just the pushing down. Mm -hmm. okay? But like, Nile. if you see, all right, yeah. yes, right? Yeah. So this is the one where you say, girl, you're just in denial. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know his schedule by heart. <laughs> you know what his favorite food is without being told. Mm -hmm. How did you find out? You're kind of obsessed with him because you have a crush on him. And she's like, oh, it's just so happened, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Denial is a way um, to manage that. I don't know why the girl doesn't want to admit that she has a crush on the boy mm -hmm. or vice versa. Or the boy doesn't want to admit that he has a crush on the boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but sometimes that happens. Okay. And that's called denial. Okay. Another a very common example is uh, there. <sighs> Sometimes we cannot express our feelings directly towards the people we want to express them to. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, you're mad at your teacher, okay? Mm -hmm. Teacher's not giving you grades, okay? Mm -hmm. Or your teacher's super demanding mm -hmm. and, um, and it just sucks and you're mad. Mm -hmm. But you can't express that to the teacher because we're socialized and taught not to do that. Okay? Mm -hmm. So who else do you express? So you're, you have all this anger, but you have nowhere to put it because I'm not supposed to be mad at the teacher. So it gets repressed, pushed down, but it can't stay there. Okay, okay, It's too hard for the ego to keep pushing it down all the time. So it lets it out a little bit somewhere else. Maybe you slam the door mm -hmm. of your room. Okay, That's called? Displacement. Displacement. Right. Yeah. Or even if you right. get mad at someone else, like you let it out in someone else, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. mo yung kapatid mo. Yeah. Because <laughs> you can't do that to your teacher, right? So these are, um, yeah, other things. Uh, one more. So displacement. Oh, okay. Another one is um, reaction formation. Okay? Mm -hmm. Reaction mm -hmm. formation is when you act the complete opposite way of how you actually feel about mm -hmm. the person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Say you're mad at your um say you're mad at your mom. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're mad at your mom because you <laughs> uh you just wanted to take a break. Okay. You're like, mom, I just want a break. Or your sister, mm -hmm. I just want a break. Can I please just not I'll wash all the dishes next week? Can I please not? And then they're like, nah, 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 nah. and so what you do instead of expressing how angry you are, what you do is you wash the dishes, you clean the bathroom, 
you wash the clothes, you do everything, mm -hmm. right? And then, and, but you're doing it not because you want to make them feel better. You're doing it because you're mad, mm -hmm. right? So but maybe you don't. Opposite of yeah, you're doing the total yeah. opposite. So do you see behavior like that sometimes mm -hmm. in other people? Like even when you like someone, for example, let's say, let's use the example a while ago. Person A has a crush on person B, but person mm -hmm. A is in, in denial and mm -hmm. everyone's telling them, oh, you have a crush on person B, but he, he or she really doesn't want to accept that. And then they start acting like they hate yeah, the other person. I think it's a very common example. It's like sometimes when we like someone and we, we really want to hide it, you act like you hate them or you start ignoring them, even though it's like a way to hide how you truly feel. Okay. Right. Okay. So that's called reaction formation. And um, Freud says that, uh, said that these um, defense mechanisms are normal. Okay. Um, and they are unconscious. So we don't know that we do them. So it's really hard to actually catch these things in yourself. Um, it's, much easier to see them in other people because when they happen to us they're unconscious but he actually says you know like don't they're not always unhealthy we have to find ways for us to release these unconscious things and feelings that we have and so um it only becomes unhealthy if you you get stuck with one and you keep doing it okay so if you're always in denial that's unhealthy. If you're all, if your reaction to all um, conflict is reaction formation, that's unhealthy. If your reaction to all negative feelings is displacement or positive feelings, okay, for example, you're always doing displacement, you're always never expressing your feelings directly towards their appropriate targets. What if you have a nice feeling about someone? What if you actually like that, you're attracted to someone, you're drawn to someone, but you're always doing this displacement thing, you will have a hard time expressing it to this person. Even if there's nothing wrong with it. <coughs> it's just you <coughs> got used to doing that. So instead of being, you know, approaching, you're just going to be super sweet to your friends. Mm -hmm. But then that gets in the way of your life. Yeah, right a lot of missed right. opportunities yeah right. so so there it's only when you you uh get rigid in terms of your use of these um defense mechanisms that's where it starts to get um i guess the term is pathological okay that's when it gets harmful so so yeah so that's a little bit about freud there's much 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 uh more to talk about Freud honestly whenever I talk about Freud it takes some time because there's a lot to talk about there it's juicy and interesting but maybe that's our little intro for now all right so I guess we move on to the neo-freudians or those who came after Freud but are still influenced by him so maybe we can talk about Carl Jung and how did he come to hypothesize about the collective unconscious oh how did he get there Okay, I don't know if that was a little slip, but because how Carl Jung actually hypothesized about the collective unconscious was his own experiences with psychological breakdowns <laughs> and um, psychosis. Uh, well, what would be labeled as psychosis? So, don't think we have enough time to talk about it right now. So, but why? you could like yeah. you could. Uh, the people watching could explore that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Look up at how Carl Jung actually began to hypothesize these things. It'll it's interesting and it'll prepare you for your personality psych uh, when you actually take that subject. Mm -hmm. So Carl Jung uh, was one of the people who worked closely with, um, he was in the inner circle of Sigmund Freud at a certain point. So he was greatly influenced by Freud's idea of the unconscious, this part of us that, you know, uh, influences our behavior, but we cannot directly access. Um, but Carl Jung, after, after a while, uh, broke ranks with Sigmund Freud because he started theorizing differently. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, cheese miss over there that you want to, if you want to explore, you can. 
Um, but his idea that was very different from Freud's is how he looked at the unconscious. Because Freud's unconscious is like this deep, dark pit that's full of scary um, things and, you know, the things that cannot be uh, accepted in daily life or in, you know, the deviant things that people want to do. But Carl Jung had a different idea about how, okay, we have this unconscious, but it actually just holds uh, ideas and concepts that we cannot um, hold in our memory, okay? So not in conscious awareness. So we create what is called the personal unconscious, okay? mm -hmm. repository of your memories, of your dreams, of motivations, etc. But more interestingly, and what he, he is best known for, is this idea of the collective unconscious. Uh, Carl Jung says that over the millennia that our species has been conscious and has been having conscious experiences, we have been creating what, what is called the collective unconscious. This consciousness that is that connects us all together. Mm -hmm. okay. So we are the unconscious is not just made up of mm -hmm. our own experiences, we are connected to each other via this thing called the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. And that's where we kind of dump all our experiences, our, all our human experiences. And because it's such a, it's filled with all the human experiences of all these people throughout millennia. And what is in there okay so imagine in your life if you look at your own uncon you know your own life you might be able to see patterns of behavior right personality is a pattern of behavior mm -hmm. i am like this say i like to wear makeup mm -hmm. and do my hair because uh, my some parts of my life have taught me to be very expressive you know with my body um, so imagine that I'm just talking about myself, right? So imagine all of human, you know, the human species and human beings, all of their experiences, what patterns will arise from that? Okay. And this is where, um, he came up with the idea that, oh, in the collective unconscious arise what he called our archetypes. Mm -hmm. These big patterns that actually show human experience. So we're not gonna go into that so deeply here, okay? Go into that when you get into personality psych, but this is my favorite, so, and I'm biased. One way that we really see archetypes in everyday life is we look at, um, Look at the epic tales, like old legends of heroes, um, um, holy men, uh, the yung, uh, like the albularios, <laughs> uh, and how and you look at all these stories across cultures, across different civilizations, and how when you look at these stories, there will be similarities. Mm -hmm these similar characters. There's always a wise old man, mm -hmm. right? There's always um, the hero. Mm -hmm. There's always a mother, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. Um, or you could even look at specific stories, like, for example, flood myths, okay? Flood myths in, there are flood myths in Japan. There are flood myths in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. There are flood myths in the Mediterranean. Are there flood myths in the north i am not sure but i'm pretty sure the ones i mentioned there are mm -hmm. so in these three different places where pre time when they communicated by trade as far as we know um they had similar stories mm -hmm. so how do stories like that come about well maybe floods are one of those archetypal experiences of human beings over millennia okay mm -hmm. So because these are experiences that happen again and again and again, until now we experience floods mm -hmm. and it's still devastating every time we experience it. 
So imagine all the experiences of all human beings of floods through the millennia. This forms the archetype that we call the flood myth. Mm -hmm. right? And that's found across culture, across time. Those are the objects in our collective unconscious. Right? So I don't know. I imagine one common experience that people have is um, um, well, women, because, you know, it's important for the species to propagate, yeah. to give birth, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? So that's, again, like the, the image of the mother, mm -hmm. of the child, like, birth or child rear. That's and and caring for the child, nurturing the child. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's one of those big archetypes mm -hmm. that we find in um, look at the stories about the gods and goddesses, the myths, um, the the legends. There's always some of it because that is just one big archetype or how we call Mother Earth, the Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. right? That shows the archetype of how we think and the functions of and the experiences of human beings kind of collected into this one pattern that we now recognize every time it shows up. Mm -hmm. So that's um, yeah. that's Carl Jung. There's a mm. lot to explore there, but let's reserve that for our personality um, psych. Yeah. Okay. How about Alfred Adler's birth order theory? Is that still relevant today? Okay. So Alfred Adler is again one of the people we will revisit when we take up personality psych. Um, he is also one of the people in Freud's inner circle that broke away after a bit okay so we see the beginnings of psychology um, began with sigmund freud's inner circle and then everybody kind of just broke up with him lots of <laughs> it's been a very there. interesting Again. personality yeah yeah, yeah. okay people so, can make up um, on that yeah uh adler had this idea about how um people are motivated pushed and this is what creates personality, what we know as personality, by this idea of inferiority. Mm -hmm. um, and inferiority is just this feeling that, oh, I'm helpless, I, I, am, I am weak, I am helpless, I should be something um, more. Mm -hmm. And so this is what pushes people forward to, into their development. Okay. So... Um, Alfred Adler is best known for his birth order theory, meaning that people, uh, people's personalities are affected by what order they are in the family, which child they are. And this is something interesting, especially in the Filipino context, because I guess we're known for having bigger, big families mm -hmm. still, or being at least very close. Yeah, very family, family oriented, yes. Right? So when we say someone is the bunso, Okay, what is the expected um, trait? What are the expected traits from a bunso? I think a lot of them, a lot of people think that they're spoiled or that they can get away with a lot of things because okay. the parents are more lenient with them. Okay. Um, yeah. They right. also tend to be more um, maybe rebellious, I think, okay. or the younger children. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And then what comes to mind when you think of uh, Panganay, mm -hmm. the eldest? Probably the most independent, self-sufficient, responsible one has to take care of the younger siblings, has to sometimes um, pursue the family business or do what the parents want. All right. Okay. So lots of pressure on the eldest child to be responsible and to kind of um, do, do as they're told, okay, versus the youngest child that kind of gets away with everything um, and gets what they want, okay? uh, rebels against mm -hmm. the, the parents. Okay, so why do we say these things? Because again, okay, common experiences, right? I'll just, just throw it in just because it's what I am. What are, what are I expected about the, of the middle children? Hmm, I think we're, we tend to are, be- Are you a middle child too? Uh, 
I'm slightly a middle child. I have a fraternal okay. twin, but okay. I'm one minute older, so okay. I'm the middle child. I'm okay. the middle child, but okay. um, I guess we tend to be very competitive, I think. or Because um, I would also see that people would pay attention to either my sister or my, my older sister. Sometimes um, we can also fade into the background or mm -hmm. not much attention and maybe mm -hmm. that can lead us to want to seek attention from other people also or right. want to stand out in other areas of life all right so it's interesting you're saying that right because i was just saying why do i do this why do i feel a need to be so expressive of myself i'm a middle child okay so i know that experience of uh, people are paying attention to the younger children, people are paying attention to the older children. Uh, nobody remembers who I am. <laughs> so, so Adler would say that that was my experience of inferiority. Okay? I experienced inferiority by this whole not having power, not having identity um, in my family. And so what I am doing now, maybe, because of my birth order, is finding ways to express myself as different from in the world right so i i am what you're saying that i'm very competitive um i'm not competitive towards other people but i i am so um particular about being myself <laughs> so in that way there is an assertion of myself and that came from my experience in my family my experience of inferiority in my family. So each person, in depending on what your order, your your whether you're the what's in the family, and you can see how it can blend. Um, you know, some people can have characteristic of the eldest child and the middle child. Some people can have the characteristic of the youngest child and the middle child. Some people are just like middle children. Some people are like bunso. Some people are like panganay lang. And then even though the only child is also its own particular mm -hmm. kind of um, set of traits that Adler did uh, describe. But there, that's how you think about it. Like each person's experience, what each person had to fight for as a child growing up is affected by the family, the system in the family and where they were in that system. So that's why, that's how birth order, the birth order, order theory though nobody really it's not a new theory it's not really pursued anymore but it's still interesting to look at and and, and it's interesting to see how some of it might still make sense in our own lives today definitely mm -hmm. so all of these theories that we've talked about freud and the neo freudians talk a lot about things that aren't necessarily in our control but are there aspects of our personality that we can control okay all right so right the three people we talked about freud young adler, adler um i guess any freudian theorist they would be seen as quite um deterministic mm -hmm. right meaning your past experiences control you mm -hmm. what is in your unconscious controls you uh, and so to be a good person is like a, a struggle because you're dealing with things that you don't know so for all of them i think awareness is very important bringing things into the conscious uh is important um so for pride that is the ego for Actually, for, for young, it was a little bit different. It was about exploring the unconscious. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, Adler is just like, yeah, it's unconscious if you don't need it. It's conscious if you need it. Um, but the next wave of uh, theories, some of which we've already actually discussed in more depth uh, when we talked about... Uh, um, reinforcement, mm -hmm. um, operant conditioning, Behavior classical principles. conditioning, yes. right? So um, there is a part of that, a sub part of um, the behaviorist point of view uh, called the uh, social cognitive view, mm -hmm. where we don't just look at 
uh, a person and a person's reaction to the environment, which is another deterministic mm -hmm. view, okay, mm -hmm. much like Freud and you know psychoanalysis, very deterministic. Behaviorism, also quite deterministic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But somewhere out of there, um, this theorist, Rother, mm -hmm. okay, looked at what he called was the locus of control. Mm -hmm. right? And and this is this kind of touches upon your question of do we have control? Yeah. Okay. And Rother said that there are two ways <laughs> that we perceive control mm -hmm. and that depends on where our locus of control is. Mm -hmm. So have he he said there are two there are two places where your control could be. Mm -hmm. It can be external, meaning you feel that you have less control and what has more control is your environment mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. so having external locus of control means you feel that um hmm, what are day-to-day -day examples of that uh gosh examples like, used to if be you're just a a graphic i can't uh -huh. give the example anymore go ahead or like a student and they think that only teachers can dictate their grades and they can't really do anything about that um they don't or if someone feels um not motivated and they think that not studying like studying won't really make a difference because um i'll just get uh teachers will just give me low grades or okay. grades with, that they want yeah okay so the external locus locus of control in that perspective is the control is with my teacher none of it is with me mm -hmm. okay so yeah. it's kind of like fate mm -hmm. right yeah. it's not in my control mm -hmm. okay actually believing in fate um like you know um uh <laughs> if it's meant to be it's meant to be <laughs> like things like that that is an example right. of external locus of control mm -hmm. meaning it's not in my hands it's in the stars mm -hmm. okay. it's not in my hands it's in the teachers mm -hmm. some people can be like that mm -hmm. okay some people can have external locus of control. And so I guess um, in many ways, you can look at the older theories of depth psychology and a lot of the control is external. Mm -hmm. I am like this because this is how I grew up. I am like this because mm -hmm. this is how all, you know, all humanity formed this pattern. Therefore, this is the pattern I'm. I am uh, expressing, but it is outside of me. It is not in me. Mm -hmm. um, so that's quite external, right? Uh, however, having an internal locus of control is a different experience, okay? So just going with your example of the student, okay? What would a student with internal locus of control uh, look like? I think they would be motivated by their... Um working hard and that if, if I study hard enough, then I'll be able to get the results that I want or the grades that I want. Yeah. Okay. So having an internal locus of control means the responsibility for outcomes is internal. I hold my fate. Okay. I hold the outcomes of um, these uh, actions. Okay. But what's reality like? It's probably a mixture of both, right? Mm -hmm. So there are things in our control, and then there are also things that are outside of our control. So I guess it's never really completely one or the other. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Because if you just throw all to the wind and say, let God do, or the universe just do whatever, mm -hmm. then you're saying, I mean, that might not be healthy or adaptive because what are you going to do then? Mm -hmm. You don't take any responsibility for any action that you take or you might not take any action because you're, you don't think your actions will um, have any effect. Okay? Versus having completely internal, everything is under my control. Everything mm -hmm. is my decision. Well, it's actually quite, to be frank, there, you, not everything is your decision. Even if you make decisions, no matter how much you plan, sometimes things will not uh, be according to how you want. Okay. So yeah, rotters. So um, 
those are two extremes mm -hmm. that show uh, well, that we probably have to balance that out somewhere in the middle <laughs> because reality is that, yeah, we have some control, but also some things we have no control of. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, jumping from that, okay, so the, the older theories are more external, okay, um, but the one new, the third wave after the wave of behaviorism is called. Um, is this perspective that shifts the control more into ourselves. Mm -hmm. okay? And maybe this wave was also just, just like how uh, we do, it's healthy for us to balance, uh, mm -hmm. know that some things are not in our control and some things are. Mm -hmm. Maybe this was psychology's effort to do that. Because okay? mm -hmm. much of the theory was about you know, things are not, not that are not in our control. So this wave called the humanistic perspective came up and said, wait, 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 wait. some things are in our control. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, yeah, so this perspective mm -hmm. uh, focuses on people's free will. Okay. And uh, people's potential. Mm -hmm. I guess my question, do you have any questions for me about so, this third wave? Uh, um, I, there's a very popular hierarchy of needs by Abraham Maslow. So how does it tell us about, what does it tell us about human potential and how are we driven by these needs? Okay, so Maslow's hierarchy of needs shows that there are five levels, okay? Mm -hmm. It starts with the lowest level is physiological needs. And then the second level is safety needs, safety and security. Third level is love and belongingness mm -hmm. needs. Fourth level is self-esteem needs. And the highest one is called self-actualization. Self-actualization. And for Maslow, uh, he he had a lot to say about self-actualization, about how people, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is the highest, the fullest expression of a human being. Mm -hmm. But we have to go through each step to get there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I just want to give some very realistic examples of how, yeah, you can't get to um, love and belongingness needs or esteem needs if you don't satisfy the lower needs. Mm -hmm. Like a very simple example is, can you pay attention to things when you're hungry? Mm -hmm. Like hungry. really hungry. Yeah. All you can think about is having food and getting that energy, I guess. Right. Not, yeah, you won't be able to study or sometimes you can't even um, focus on conversations you have with other people. Right. Yeah. So I, we get hangry. Yes. Because right. hunger is a physiological need. Right? Mm -hmm. So if in, in the greater scheme of things, right, if somebody is so desperate as to be wanting food, how can they uh, want things like... Um, appreciate things like uh, art mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. beauty. They just, their bodies need attention first. Mm -hmm. okay. So that sounds very simplistic and there's actually a lot of things we can talk about here, counter or like the exploration of Maslow um, into the complexity of this, but again, we'll reserve that for um, personality class. Okay. But yeah, basically that's what Maslow is saying. If a person's physiological needs are not met, then it's very hard to go up. Mm -hmm. Safety and security needs include, um, you know, our physical safety, mm -hmm. you know, uh, knowing we'll be safe. How can we sleep at night uh, if we don't know we're safe? Mm -hmm. okay, so actually that's like a halfway between physiological needs and safety needs. Mm -hmm. um, how can we study, for example, if we're, so, if we're scared? Mm -hmm. Yeah we're feeling threatened mm -hmm. right um so because things like studying mm -hmm. um where is that even where do maybe, you think studying is in the maybe around esteem because or somewhere between esteem and self-actualization because you can uh we study often to get a job or mm -hmm. have a have a career and that is related to our sense of self-esteem, our sense, our idea of ourselves, who we want to be in society. But it can mm -hmm. also be like people can also think about it as a way to expand their knowledge and expand their potential in that way. So I think it's halfway between there. But All yeah, right. you can't really um, focus on that if 
uh, amid this pandemic, for example, we, right. there's a lot it's hard. of, yeah, right? it's hard. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you're stressed about your safety. You're stressed about the safety of your family. You're stressed about, um, you know, the internet connection, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you're stressed because you haven't seen, uh, <laughs> your friends, uh, for months, uh, you're stressed because you haven't, you know, you don't have a good relationship with, you know, maybe somebody in your family. Okay. So you can't, fo- it's hard to focus on that because that's somewhere in the, in the esteem area mm-hmm. because your love and belongingness needs are not met because your mm-hmm. safety needs are not met because your physiological needs are not met. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's what that's, again, there's a, this is a very simplistic discussion. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there there might be like a lot of questions and like you know counter arguments and that's true. There are there is a lot to be talked about here, um, but basically that's what Maslow is trying to say. It is hard to appreciate these things because there is an order that these things need to be met. Um, like for example, if you're starving. What can you do? <laughs> if your physiological needs are not met, you will die. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so even just at that basic thing, you cannot move up if this is not met. Okay. So how is that? Um, how is that humanistic? Okay, I'll just say because that way of discussing it is very like, how is that humanistic? How does that talk about our potentials? Well, it's because. Um, Maslow is saying that we all have the potential to reach that fullness of who we are, and that, that to reach yeah. self-actualization. It's just, it's not easy. Mm-hmm. He says, it's not easy to get there because you have to go through all these things. You have to meet all these needs first. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's mm-hmm. Maslow. Mm-hmm. So Carl Rogers has this um, term called the self-actualization tendency. So how is this self-actualization tendency different from self-actualization as conceptualized by Maslow? Okay, so Carl Rogers' self-actualization tendency talks about how um, everything, uh, like seeds and... um, uh, any living babies, yeah. uh, seeds, babies, puppies. Okay, um, you could say, yeah, anything alive mm-hmm. okay, has this tendency to want to be its fullest self. Mm-hmm. It its fullest to achieve its fullest potential. So. It's, this is the whole, an acorn, uh, sorry, very non-Filipino. Um, <laughs> a seed has the potential in it, you know, if it's tiny, to grow into a tree. Mm-hmm. So everything that is alive is pushed by this actualization tendency yeah. to become its fullest self. Mm-hmm. So as human beings, we have that push in us. Mm-hmm. We want to be the fullest ourself that we can be and, but who is that and what is that kind of gets complicated mm-hmm. okay because as we grow up we get to know ourselves okay but to know that ourselves that the self that has the potential to come out we build that concept via our interactions with other people mm-hmm. okay so if your uh, parent tells you, oh, you're the smart one. You're so smart. You read so many books, you're going to be a lawyer. Because mm-hmm. lawyers are helpful people. Mm-hmm. Right? So, and maybe there are people in the room whose parents are lawyers, mm-hmm. and this sounds like a, mm-hmm. a very familiar, familiar <laughs> narrative. Or replace lawyer with whatever, doctor. Doctor, engineer. engineer. <laughs> uh, what are the common ones? Lawyer, doctor, engineer. Uh, or I don't know. So yeah, yeah, common narratives, right? So when we are faced with a, with a concept like that, this is what a good person is: a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, a mother, a father. <laughs> you will have children. You will. Um, start a family, you will uh, start a business, okay, all of these things. 
um, what it does is we begin to see ourselves through the eyes of the other person. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, what Carl Rogers called a self-concept. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we do, we do not know ourselves, but we explore ourselves through our experiences with other people. Um, and that allows us to know a little bit of ourselves, mm -hmm. okay? but not all. Mm -hmm. okay? So, um, and the danger is that if our self-concept is um, affected so much by other people's perceptions, sometimes who we think we are, it's not actually who we are. Mm -hmm. And this is what creates a problem called incongruence. Right? Between so, our real selves and this ideal that we've perceived from maybe other people. Yes. Right. So, um, so yeah, maybe that's how some of us put a lot of pressure on ourselves to perform in a certain way, uh, a certain task. Like maybe you think being a good person is means you have to be good at math, um, because somebody in your family was smart and was good at math, but that's not the own. And there's nothing wrong with that. Maybe it's not your version of what it means to be a full human being mm -hmm. right um but if that was all you saw oh this is what it means to be a good person means i'm gonna be an engineer but you're but that's not what is in you already what is what can be pushed out of you is not to be an engineer what if what is naturally in you is not that kind of structure what if it's the structure of music, mm -hmm. something actually quite structured and so technical, but very different from engineering. Mm -hmm. But because this was what was shown to you, this is what was built into your self-concept, and you never got to have experiences of music and the structure of music, you don't know. So you're pushing yourself to be an engineer, but it's so hard because that's not what's in you. That's not what's in the seed of your being so you're not growing and it's really hard mm -hmm. and that's what causes some problems um as we grow up okay so, all right so yeah. how do we promote the congruency then between the real self and I our ideal selves well this is where we go from i think i'm gonna jump from carl rogers and i'm gonna jump into uh the uh, the box with Eric Erickson because mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll say this is where the idea of um, role confusion okay or jumping you know looking around and trying out different things comes in mm -hmm. because only when we do that we it's like looking at different mirrors okay mm -hmm. different mirrors will show you different aspects of yourself and um, if you only look at one, if the only mirror you, you ever look at is the mirror of your parents, okay, how they perceive you, mm -hmm. then that is only um, one part of your self-concept mm -hmm. that you'll ever build. But if you, have, you explore through many mirrors, then you're likely to be able to explore more of your real self. Mm -hmm and therefore know more of yourself. And that can, is something that will help you be more congruent. Mm -hmm. How about branching off from the humanistic perspective? How is the trait perspective different from all of these other perspectives? All right. So the trait perspective to me is the nerdiest and most technical of all the mm -hmm. personality perspectives. Because uh, how it started is just the idea of um, how do we actually have proof that uh, these things like extroversion or introversion or uh, friendliness versus um, aloofness, how do we know that these things are actually there, part of the structure of personality? Okay? So um, the start of it was is this thing called the lexical hypothesis, okay? where um, some people uh, <laughs> sit outboard was it capel i don't know which mm -hmm. some of them mm -hmm. uh it started with them said that hey personality would be embedded mm -hmm. in how we describe personality so it would be this embedded in language so the structures of personality mm -hmm. would be embedded in language and mm -hmm. so 
these researchers, what they did was literally take words uh, from the dictionary. Di yeah, yeah, descriptive words from the dictionary, and then they started bunching it into groups, and then you know, um, you know, like what's the root word of this? What's the root word of this? What's the root word of this? Until they found that they could bunch these uh, words into particular uh, groups and they, they called it, and they gave these groups a label. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they would call it factors. Mm -hmm. uh, they would call it, uh, they would, well, the trait, the mm -hmm. word trait was, uh, came up because of that mm -hmm. um so they these these things started called being called traits then they started being called personality factors but the uh newest uh the most recent is it still the i guess it's widely safe. used it's the most yeah widely used and most researched mm -hmm. uh now uh they narrowed down like something i don't even know how many words hundreds of thousands yeah, of words. thousands thousands okay. yeah down to five okay mm -hmm. so the structure of human personality can be narrowed down to five big traits okay mm -hmm. and these are called the big five mm -hmm. and when you test when you take a test for the big five you're going to see how each trait actually has five uh five or six five five five, five yeah. facets okay. all right like I can't remember if it's five or six uh, facets. The traits? Oh, I don't know about the facets. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> go into that when you go into personality side. But the big five, uh, maybe some of you know know this as uh, ocean. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's. So these are these are the uh, the biggest umbrellas mm -hmm. okay, of traits that are found. Um, the studies show that they're found across cultures as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Maybe there there's just little tweaks here and there, but the big five are what's it, oh. openness, openness to experience, openness C is conscientiousness. conscientiousness, E is extroversion, A is agreeableness, agreeableness. and, and N, N is neuroticism. neuroticism. And the, these five uh, are ways for us to understand. For, for me, the way I understand it, it's just people have different mixes of each trait. Mm -hmm. And that's what creates the formula mm -hmm. that is a person's particular personality. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's like chemistry. How do you mix these ingredients to make this particular person? Okay. And, and these are the traits. These are the ingredients that make us. So mm -hmm. there are, um, yeah, like, for example, me. Take a guess. Mm -hmm. I've taken this test multiple times, mm -hmm. so I know my score in general. How how, how do you think I uh, rate in terms of the big five? Yeah, like for example, openness to experience. I think you're you score very high in openness to experience because you're very open to a lot of yeah new experiences, to expressing yourself in unconventional ways. Yeah. Yes, and, and we've had many, many conversations mm -hmm. that show you that I am very open to experience. Yeah. <laughs> yes, when I, when I take that test, my openness to experience score is the highest possible, like stick way up there. Um, so yes, so mm -hmm. what about C? C, maybe on the lower side, because um, I guess you're not so particular with the details or... Uh, yeah, would, would you say that's... <laughs> that's some, that's congruent with you, ma'am. Yeah, I'm not, I don't do think, uh, one of the facets of um, conscientiousness is dutifulness, Dutiful. meaning to do things out of an obligation or duty. Mm -hmm. I remember that, that that's one of my lowest mm -hmm. ones because I don't do things because I have to. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm a very, I do things because I want to. <laughs> so conscientiousness, um, I know, or I think order is there. Mm -hmm. um, I can be very uh, disorganized, but I like to think of it as like organized chaos. Yeah, yeah. I um, so I don't, I'm not a rule follower mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. that I I tend to question rules. Mm -hmm. So you can see here how it, it kind of goes with my, because I'm so high mm -hmm. with openness to experience, I, it might have an effect also why I'm so low with conscientiousness because I question a lot of things like mm -hmm. how to do things and why it needs to be done, etc. So, yes. Mm -hmm. So let's see. What about 
uh, extroversion. Extroversion, yeah. I think you're in the middle because um, I think you enjoy your time alone or your your introspection, but you also have a passion for being with other people and helping other people. So would that would you say that's true okay. for you? Yeah, I am. Um, the last time I tested, I was above average. So, so a, a little more extroverted. Yeah, a little more extroverted than introverted. Okay, what about agreeableness? Agreeableness, um, maybe like in the in the terms related with your conscientiousness and the openness to experience where you don't necessarily, you, you kind of are very independent and would want things your way. You're not completely like, you're not so sociopathic where you totally go <laughs> against yeah, everyone, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you're very um, determined to express your individuality. Okay, all right. One of the sub facets of agreeableness is modesty and mm -hmm. I think straightforwardness. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm very straightforward and very straightforward people are, 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 are typically low agreeable. Um, and I am not uh, my modesty, <laughs> meaning, meaning mm -hmm. I don't like hide things. I'm very expressive and frank. Mm -hmm. It's also very low. So, those are the two things I remember that that caused my agreeableness score to be below average. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm not, um, but yeah, in there is also gullibility. So I think suspiciousness or something like that. So I'm not, I'm not very trusting of people mm -hmm. um, as, because I tend to question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that yeah. means I'm, I don't, I don't really go with the flow in terms of, you know, just how to be with people. I, I and again, that reflects also my openness to experience score mm -hmm. yeah. um, because I tend to kind of like forge my own path mm -hmm. or something like that. And then finally, what about and neuroticism. neuroticism? I think you're very also low in neuroticism because typically um, I think expresses how it is the difficulty of people to go back to emotional baseline or to regulate their emotions. Mm -hmm. I think you're, you're able Emotion to do that ability. very well. Yeah, I okay. think you're very able do that i'm actually in the middle mm, okay. because low neuroticism is like uh less ability to feel oh so high higher emotional uh yeah like kind of like they don't have a range a wide range of like mm. emotions of negative oh, emotions I most of all um people who are high in neuroticism have a high tendency to feel negative mm. emotions mm -hmm. so low means you have don't really feel negative emotions so i'm somewhere in the middle where i do feel negative emotions i'm just not uh super 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 prone to them okay so so yeah so uh that's the big five that's what makes the mix that is my personality um you honestly I think we're kind of close, honestly, mm -hmm. Selena. Mm -hmm. Except for the conscientiousness. You're yeah, way yeah. More conscientious I'm, than me. I'm pretty. I've scored pretty high in that when I took it in. Yeah. Assessment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but I think your openness to experience, if you take it now, it's going to be pretty, pretty high. <laughs> and your. Um... I, I think I'm pretty high agreeableness. Okay. All right. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. But every yeah, I think we're also the, we're same in openness extroversion i'm also slightly more extroverted and neuroticism pretty and moderate too okay all right there so maybe now at the end of this uh we, what we are trying to do is we want to encourage you to get into like go study the parts of this chapter that are more interesting to you mm -hmm. because um it may also show you a lot more about yourself mm -hmm. your choice of personality theory like what personality theory you agree with or you uh, feel like helps you understand yourself tells you a lot also about yourself That's so right. I want to encourage everyone to do that go deeper with the ones that you find more interesting all right so I guess that's the end of our podcast and the end of our general psychology podcast for now so thank you so much Mampia for sharing your knowledge with us you all learned so much I'm sure and yeah any last words? <laughs> oh, well, I'll see you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> During uh, our debriefing or maybe like, maybe we can do another Q&A at mm -hmm. some point, mm -hmm. you know, next year before we end, all, we end this sub quarter. All right. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. Thank Hope you. That, hope that helps. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Bye. Right. Bye.